What's up? Today I'd love to share with you an opening which I think is going to become one of my main openings for white, at least for Blitz. And in fact I learned it from one of you guys. A student of, m of mine shared a beautiful game that he played and won and he added in the same email that he actually is having great successes with this opening which is the Belgrade Gambit. Now what is a Belgrade Gambit? Well, it uh, derives from the Four Knights game here after Knight C3, Knight of 6. And normally the Four Knights game is considered to be, you know, symmetric and drawish, but there is a way to spice it up, which is this Belgrade gamut. You start off with Pawn D4, breaking through in the center, and after that, you jump with your Knight forward to D5. And honestly, in the past, they thought that it's not a serious opening, and just with a few precise moves, Black would probably refute it. But I analyzed it more thoroughly while preparing this video and I was fascinated because the opening turned out to be a lot more interesting and s much stronger than I thought. In fact, even with the best play, Black can just equalize, but there are a, a, a lot of pitfalls along the way. And if your opponents aren't like really, really well prepared here, they can get in trouble really quick. Let me show you one game just to give you a taste of it. For example, what can black do right now? This knight on d5 is a bit annoying, right? It controls a lot of squares in black's territory. What can black do? Black probably does not want to take here, because after that you recapture, attack the knight. If it goes back, you can pick up the pawn there on d4, and all is just great. So that's not the way for black to refute this. Let's come back. What else can black do? The most principal way should be knight takes e4, grabbing the other pawn which was left undefended. And in this case, there are a couple options for white. For example, you can go bishop c4, just trying for quick development and attack. Now, what can black do now? Notice that this knight controls the square b4, and therefore black can't easily play bishop b4 and deliver a check to your king because you can just grab the bishop. If not that, then what should black do? Let's also not forget that white threatens to play queen e2, take advantage of the pin and potentially even win the knight or put black in trouble. And in light of that, black decided to retreat with their knight to c5, because from there it's also ready to play knight a6 and just completely solidify their position and lock the e-file. After that, it's hard to believe that white is already winning, so basically black can resign right here after the move bishop g5. Even though it's completely not obvious how white wins here. In the game, black played an awkwardly passive move knight to e7, but there is no better choice actually, and as I said, all the moves of black are losing here. Instead of knight e7, it looks more natural to play pawn f6. But then it weakens this diagonal, and white can take an advantage of that and try delivering something like a scholar's checkmate after knight h4, aiming for queen h5 check. And there is not much black can do here, really. There is no way to stop that. If they take the bishop, for example, we play queen h5, and we just deliver this brutal checkmate, really. Knight takes g6, we just break through, and this is checkmate. That's it. This square is controlled by the knight, and the queen attacks from this angle. Therefore, that's not the solution. And for that reason, in the game, black played knight e7, because you gotta address threat to the queen, and also this knight is annoying, therefore black played knight e7. Anyway, still looks unclear, but why just play knight e5? Why just goes all out for this quick attack? And right now, this square f7 becomes vulnerable, and potentially white can even maybe checkmate there, or at least create a lot of problems for black. Black played the move they planned earlier, knight e6, trying to you know, solidify everything, close the diagonals, and attack this bishop along the way. But white ignored that and just continued his attack by playing queen f3, threatening simple checkmate queen takes f7 with the support of this knight. What can black do? Well, black is actually defenseless because, you know, there's just... the white's pressure here is simply too strong. Black decided to take on g5, because it defends the pawn and attacks the queen. It, it looks winning for black, but that's the moment where white delivered the final blow, and it's a really spectacular combination. Queen takes f7, all of a sudden, sacrificing the entire queen, and after that white gives up the knight to finally deliver this stunning checkmate by their bishop. White actually sacrificed pretty much all of their pieces to deliver this spectacular checkmate. It was a really impressive game, and it's it's actually quite practical. I mean, there is a, a chance for you to play a similar line in your own game. Of course, Black has a couple other options here, and we're gonna analyze them in a moment, but I do understand that in comments for such videos, some of you guys will write that it's all good, but studying opening traps is not the way to become a strong player. And you know what? I perfectly agree. 
Studying openings or opening traps is just one piece of a puzzle, but learning to play the middle game stage is equally important, if not more important. Generally, if you follow me for a long time, you know that I always say that chess is a strategic game, and the main way to become a stronger chess player is to advance your strategic understanding, to level up your positional chess. That's how you become a stronger chess player overall. And with that being said, I'm really happy to announce the launch of my new course, Top 25 Middle Game Concepts. I've been working on this course for the last several months, and I'm really proud of the outcome. Because I do think that it's going to help you become a stronger player after studying this course, because indeed, opening and middle game are two most important stages of the game. End game is a bit less important, because even though it's useful to know it, but overall you have a lot of opportunities or either to win or to you know, spoil your position earlier <laughs> throughout the game before it reaches an endgame. But learning to play opening and middle game together is completely essential. And in this course I wanted to summarize most critical knowledge about the middle game stage, because theoretically there are hundreds of books, rules, patterns, plans, pawn structures, and so on and so forth about the middle game. But if you don't want to become a grandmaster, then perhaps you don't need to know all that. And that said, it's still required to know the minimum of most critical knowledge that gives you the overall greatest improvement. If you heard of the 80-20% rule, so I wanted to find those 20% of most practical, most useful rules about the middle game that gives you the greatest improvement overall. And that's how I came up with those 25 most critical concepts that you need to know. And right now, because the course is just launched, you can take advantage of the launch offers, and you can get it with a 50% discount, and on top of that, you're gonna get another flagship course, uh, the Calculate Till Mate, for free. So overall, your uh, savings will be over $200 if you get this course right now. So if you're interested, you may click the link below the video and check out the details. And with that being said, let's come back to the opening video. Since this knight on d5 is annoying, one of the most common ways of black would be to try to trade it off. It's not the best option for black, because after a pawn recaptures, it attacks the knight, forcing it to go. After the knight goes away, you can now safely get your pawn back, and you're already having a space advantage, you know, easy development for your PCs. Your queen is centralized here nicely, keeps an eye on this pawn uh, on the king side. Therefore, definitely it's not the best way for black, but nevertheless, lots of your pawns will still play. Now, mostly black goes here, pawn d6, and there are a number of good ways for, for a white to play here. I think the easiest one is to play a bishop d3. Why is that so? Well, it's because we take aim at this square. Your pawns are highly likely to play knight f5 on the next move, and we want to just be able to eliminate this knight from there. Your pawns are going to go knight f5, trying to win a tempo by taking your queen, but now, thanks to your bishop, you don't have to lose time and move the queen away, you can just exchange the knight, and after an exchange, you simply castle, and believe it or not, you're having a winning game right now. Already. Just after a couple of opening moves, even though black seemingly played standard moves and did nothing wrong. Now, what's the problem? The problem is black can't develop their bishop, or else they will lose this pawn. And if not, you're gonna play rook to e1, deliver a check to the king, and the king is in trouble. And basically, there is nothing black can do. Your opponents are likely to play bishop e7 anyway, and again, if they don't, you play rook e1 and you kind of force that move. And as soon as they play bishop e7, you can happily grab this pawn on g7 and attack the rook. If they try counter-attacking, it does not work because you still play rook e1. Check to the king, you don't need to even move the queen away. And now, what can they do? Well, basically, perhaps resign. If king moves, you can take here and you're already two pawns up and you continue attacking. After king to c8, you can even play bishop g5 and use this little attack takes, because after bishop takes, queen takes f5, attack here, attack uh, and win the bishop there. But even if you don't remember all these lines, you know, it's just for illustrative purposes. Basically, you have a true advantage, you attack an opponent's exposed king, and it's an easy win for white. And now let's take a look at the main line. As we already know, knight takes d5 is rather bad for black, where you capture with a tempo. Therefore, the main move is knight takes e4, grabbing the pawn. In this case, there are a number of options for white, but I suggest that you play for quick development and attack, as it's usually the best way of playing gambits. And with that in mind, you may play bishop d3, just simply developing a piece, attacking this knight and preparing to castle, and after that, you can start attacking along the e-file. And in all those attacks, your knight on d5 does a great job covering this e on square and causing troubles for black as it attacks all around. So bishop d3 attacks the knight. Knight is gonna come back usually, that's the main line. Now you play queen e2, and again, you take advantage of this annoying knight. Because now, as soon as they cover the king, you can take on f6, and because the bishop is pinned, 
they can't move the bishop and they have to break up their pawn structure and now the king becomes a long-term target for you. It can't really castle the king side, it's extremely dangerous, it's equally bad in the middle, and what can black really do? Well, nothing. You castle, in this case black will move the d pawn forward, pawn d6 because they need to develop their light square bishop. Now you may play rook e1, just putting more pressure along the e-file, and again black never really wants to castle because you know the king is completely exposed there, after that it will be very easy for you to develop your attack. Usually your opponents will play here bishop e6, trying to develop this bishop and also to blockade this e-file. But then there is a really key attacking move, which is worth remembering, it's bishop to b5. Pinning the knight and preparing knight takes over here on d4. In fact, there is nothing black can do to stop that, and as soon as you grab there, after whatever move of black, it just adds so much pressure. Because now, notice that there is a pin here, therefore the knight can't move from c6. We're attacking this knight, we're putting a lot of pressure over the e-file, our knight attacks all around and black's position completely collapses here, in fact it is defenseless. They will they may try castling queenside, hoping for you to take there, because it still remains more or less unclear, but instead of that you take with the bishop, and it just gives you a force and win after queen a4, queen a6, followed by knight takes c6, check to the king, and after king a8, it's just a very easy checkmate. That's it. And by the way, for those wondering about the cat on the background, it's not that the video got so boring that he decided to leave, no. He was full of excitement for the Belgrade Gambit and decided to go and give it a try. There is a final uh, line here that you gotta be aware of. We already know that knight takes d5 is rather bad for black, you recapture with a tempo. In case black decides to play the most aggressive move, knight takes e4, black is not gonna have an easy life there. There are plenty of opportunities for you to attack after bishop d3 and then you castle and you just attack rapidly. What else can black do? Well, your opponent may chicken out and play bishop e7, saying, hey, I'm so scared about this, I know nothing about this Belgrade Gambit, let me just castle quickly and just, just try to maintain you know, safety. What do you do in that case? Well, obviously playing a passive move is not the way to review the gambit, therefore we should already be happy about that. There are different ways for white to handle this, but I like the variation bishop c4. It's been a lot of fun for me and I think that it's gonna work for you just as well. Uh, overall you can see that it's the same motif, we prepare quick castling and then our rook is gonna come to e1 and support this attack. Also anytime in the future, you know, whenever you want to, you can get back to the pawn and after that the material balance will become equal. In most cases your opponent will castle, and then you castle just as well. This leaves this pawn on e4 undefended and black may decide to finally grab it because now when their king is castled it seems like black is safe to capture the pawn. Once again, if not, you can always just get the pawn back and save your more active position. Therefore, let's say black captures the pawn, now you play rook e1, the standard move to put pressure, taking advantage of the knight standing there, also putting more pressure. The knight from e4 is attacked, it needs to go. Your opponent is likely to play knight d6, trying to win a tempo because it attacks the bishop. And at this point, there is a really funny move that you can and probably should play. It's bishop f4. You leave the bishop undefended, pretending like you just overlook the threat and simply develop peace. And by the way, it's a good move anyway. So whether your opponent gets into a trap or not, doesn't really matter. It's, it's a nice move. And if they don't fall for, for the trap, you're just gonna probably take on e7, recapture on d4 with the queen and get a great game anyway. And if they're seduced by the bishop and grab it, then all of a sudden they lose after the bishop takes c7, attacking the queen. The only square for the queen to go to is queen e8. And now there is knight takes d4 and black collapses here on this e7 square. This bishop is attacked with your knight and rook already, therefore it's under the massive fire. The only defender is this knight from c6. And by taking on d4, we're gonna eliminate the defender, and after that, pick up the bishop on e7. And in fact, there is nothing black can do about that, because if they take here on d4 themselves, you can just play a cool move, rook takes e7, trapping the queen and winning the queen. That's nice. What else can they do? If they don't take, but let's say the main move is pawn d6, trying to give some breathing space for the queen and maybe develop the bishop, but then you take yourself on c6 and it turns out that black fails anyway. If black takes here by the queen, then there is knight takes c7. In this case we take by the knight and it's a fork to the queen and king, 
thus winning the queen. If black chooses instead to capture by the pawn, then rook takes e7 and the queen is trapped anyway. So whatever black does, you're gonna win the queen and get a winning material advantage. That's cool. By the way, if they ever take here on b2, it doesn't really change anything. Yes, it attacks your queen, but you just move the queen away. Let's say d2 or d4, and that's it, right? So that doesn't really change anything. So you're winning the game anyway. And that's really cool, because that's how you can defeat an opponent who tried to play safe, but you nevertheless found a way to win the game in the most spectacular way possible. And to wrap this up, let me also mention that in case black decides to opt for bishop c5 instead of developing their knight, then it actually fails and it's a round move and I've recorded another video explaining how to refute that move. And finally, let me also mention that the special offers in honor of launch of the new course Top 25 Middle Game Concepts are only good for several days. That's why, please don't miss out on them. If you're interested in the course, it's better to enroll right now. And whatever the case, you know, wishing you the great rest of the day. Keep crushing it, and I'll talk to you soon.